30 years ago, I lived in Europe and never wanted to come back to this godforsaken land, which I left in 1981 because I couldn't find any Americans. And an American is somebody that knows, understands, and has read the Declaration of Independence and believes it. So I went away for 10 years, and then right after the wall went down, I went to a theater, and Michael Moore, the documentarian, came in and was talking about his film, Roger and Me, and he stopped and he said, there's someone in this audience that I came here to see. You have to go back. You have to go back. You have to march in the parade. You have to beat your drum. You have to blow your horn. One person can make a difference. And I'm, so here I am. It's taken me 30 years to get here, but not only did I have to become educated about what I needed to say, but the country had to be ready to hear what I'm about to say today. I hope by when this goes far and wide, and you're going to have to make it go viral, guys, because it's that important, I hope that our country, as we know it, will change to what we would like it to be. Uh, before I even wrote a, sp I even wrote my speech out, and I haven't done that since I was valedictorian in high school. So, but I didn't want to leave anything out, so I wrote it down, which I will read my speech. But before I do, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> when the founding fathers got together, they redefined, and you have to be very careful of these words. Re, I, I hit an e a little while ago with this re business. You have to be careful of anything that's like the Renaissance. You know about the Renaissance? Okay, when was the Naissance? There was one. It was in Greece. And then the Renaissance was, was in Italy. Anything that has an RE in front of it has a meaning. The, the founding fathers redefined the word people because in their day and age, people meant royalty. People meant ducks, dukes and, and duchess and marquises and the king and the queens and the countesses. And they redefined it to people is us. We are the people and we are the power. Whatever it is, we've forgotten it, but we need to get it back and quickly, okay? Our country, the United States of America, was launched with the Declaration of Independence, signed on July 4th, 1776. This is the document which endows us with unalienable rights, among them the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Foremost among those rights is the right to own property. The founders felt so strongly about those rights that they wrote to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. In other words, the only powers conveyed to anyone who claims to, be, to hold a governmental office is to protect the rights of the men and women in this country. They have to protect the rights of the people. Here's a simple test you use to determine who these people are. If any governmental officer, either elected or appointed, is exercising power over you or attempting to exercise power over you, a man or a woman, and in the process is not protecting you or your property, he or she is not acting in an authorized manner and is, in fact, not a government employee or officer, or at least those that we instituted among men. That's a pretty simple test. The founders went on to write and ratify three more documents, the Articles of Confederation, the Northwest Ordinance, and the Constitution of the United States of America. The, those four documents, together with treaties, are and always have been the supreme law of the land. Article 6, Section 2 of the Constitution states, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. As a consequence of Article 6, all written laws must be in harmony. 
with the four organic laws and all treaties made that have been ratified. This country was forged as a constitutional republic. The Constitution at Article 1, Section 4, Clause 2 states, the Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, once in every year, and such meeting shall be on the first Monday in December unless they shall by law appoint a different day. And they did amend it later to, to make it a different day. The founders didn't foresee the perpetual politicians making lifelong careers as legislators, representatives, and senators. The reason being, we were supposed to have a minimal number of government workers, and we really didn't need any more laws on the books than the organic documents gave us, and we still don't. Indeed, instead, greed and control consumed the governmental actors, and soon, we, the people, our unalienable rights, and the duty to protect those rights fell by the wayside and we were taken over and our republic was pushed aside to make room for a democracy. When one listens to these politicians speak, you will hear where they believe they live. In other words, the only thing you hear them say is democracy. This is absolutely foreign to the country envisioned by the founders and as the antithesis of what the supreme law of the land dictates. The mechanism with which they achieved this takeover was done with economic control. He who controls the money controls everything. The war for independence from England was, in fact, a war against taxes. Does anybody remember that from their history? The outcry of the people was because they gained no benefit from paying taxes and had no say in what was done with those forced taxes. In other words, the founders resorted to war because of taxation without representation. King George took it all and gave nothing in return. It is ironic that 243 years later, the taxes being taken from the people make the tea and stamp taxes appear to be inconsequential. The usurpers of our republic have generated a system whereby we are taxed beyond our endurance and just like the founding fathers, we have no representation either. You see this, this is a republic, a state in which supreme power is held by the people and their elected representatives and which has an elected or nominated president rather than a monarch. What are we as people? What's that adjective there? Republic. Supreme, we have supreme power. We can't forget it and it's about time we used it. You see down here in the US Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, the number of representatives shall not exceed one in every 30,000. Our current representation. The 2010, 2018 census counted a total of 327.2 million people in the United States. If the Constitution was followed and one representative could have no more than 30,000 constituents, there would be 10,907 congressmen we have 435. Each representative, on average, represents 752,184 people. Is that a possibility? No. It is clearly engraved in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, that the number of representatives shall not exceed one representative for every 30,000. We saw that. If the representatives were in compliance with the Constitution, how many congressmen would we have? 10,907, almost 11,000. The representatives have proven themselves to be craftier than King George, who was thrown out after the Revolutionary War, and we as a people are left with bone-crushing taxes without representation. And yet, the people tolerate the rape, and it is rape. The people have been systematically indoctrinated and have become inured to the government taking everything for our own good. And the people's sense of well-being and security has driven them from the middle class towards the poverty line. If you are one who has suffered as a result of this conditioning, you need not enumerate the many ways in which you got here. And we need, what we need is a way out of taxation without representation and find our way back to the Republic. 
How did we get here? Let's lay this calamity at the feet of those who brought us here, the international bankers. Although there were many transgressions against and diversions from the supreme law of the land before 1860, the ingenious plan of, this, of starting a war between northern and southern parts of the country was the beginning and end of the republic. This must never be called the Civil War. A civil war is one in which two parties fight over the same territory. This was never a civil war. It was always a war of northern aggression. We may never know exactly what started the war of northern aggression. Certainly we know it was not the cannon that exploded at Fort Sumner. <clears throat> Sumter. Hostilities had developed between the North and South because of the pressures by the northern politicians to place ever-increasing tariffs on the southern cotton. The South highly resented the taking by the North of their profits because, let's face it, it was taxation without representation. The South instead gave the edict that they were seceding from the Union. In other words, they were to take their southern land. The North could keep theirs. This would have been a viable solution. The North could have rewritten the laws that would apply to the states in the North. The South could have and did adopt a new constitution for its land, the Confederate States of America. Both nations could have continued to prosper if operated under their separate laws. But Lincoln had orders to create a federal government that would put all the states under federal power and dictates. It was supposed to be a rather swift put down of a rebellion, keeping the South in the Union and forcing it to continue to contribute to the growth of the North. But the South put up more of a fight than was anticipated and the war was on. War is expensive. War is extremely expensive, both in men and materials. Somehow, each side had to finance the fighting and both sides eventually resorted to issuing military scrip. The North was called Greenbacks and the South Graybacks. And in case nobody is familiar with those, this is a, the front and the back of um, Greenback and their name for the color on the back. The, on the front it says, Act of July 11th, 1862, the United States will pay the bearer one dollar at the Treasury in New York. Wash, and this was done in Washington, August 1st, 1862. And the back says, right here in the circle, this note is a legal tender for all debts, public and private, except duties on imports and interest on the public debt, and is receivable in payment of all loans made in the United States. Made to the United States, excuse me. Here's a Confederate grayback. You see the grayback here with the 50 on it. On the front it says, 12 months after date, and they, this had a date on it, Confederate States of America will pay to bearer $1,000 with interest at 10, per, 10 cents per day. And then it has the date. On the back, and here's the, the, the kicker here, six months after the ratification, this is the back, six months after the ratification of a treaty of peace between Confederate States and the United States, the Confederate States of America will pay to the bearer on demand $50. It was signed in Richmond, September 2nd, 1861. It was receivable in payment of all dues except exports, taxes, okay? So <clears throat> those green and gray backs were the downfall of this country. Both sides bonds, <clears throat> sold, both sides sold bonds to their respective peoples who bought them with gold and silver and both sides went to English bankers for help with the transactions and to borrow money against the bonds. That was the end. So as it is now, the banks issued money against the bonds in exchange for promissory notes to borrow money against the bonds. Bonds were floated on the promise to the bond buyers that when the North was victorious, the bonds would be paid off, and when the South was victorious, the bonds would be redeemed six months after the ratification of a treaty of peace between Confederate States and the United States. 
the Confederate States of America would pay to the bearer on demand the amount of the face value in gold. <clears throat> to fund the war, Lincoln issued war bonds. Those bonds became known as 1040 bonds because they matured in 10 or 40 years. To collect the interest on the 1040 bonds, a Form 1040 was instituted and the offices of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue was created right then, okay? Let's look at a notice of federal tax lien. Happens to be mine. What kind of tax is this? Tax. No. What kind of tax is this? Yeah. Right here. Right over here. It says kind of tax. Kind of tax. That is a 1040 tax. You see over here under identifying number, you see this asterisk after the blackout? That's because I don't have a social security number. They made one up for me, and that asterisk denotes an incorrect number, illegal, unlawful number. That's what it, it says in the IRS manual. Nothing stops these guys. <clears throat> the Civil War lasted from 1861 to 1865. Lincoln died on April 15th, 1865. See any significance there? When do you get to pay the 1040 tax on Lincoln's death day? These international bankers, they're really cute. The Civil War, <coughs> April, April 15th now being the date, due date of the 1040 taxes. The American people have been paying off the debt caused by the war bonds from that, that time to this. <clears throat> what I didn't write in here is when Lee and Grant met at Appomattox, there was no surrender. This was a meeting between two old comrades that went to the, to the war college, or to, the, to the West Point together. They'd known each other for years. They were sick to death of the slaughter and they wanted to end the slaughter of the Americans. 620,000 Americans died in the, in the War of Northern Aggression. So these two met and they had a discussion and that discussion must have gone something like this. We need to, to make a peace treaty between the North and South and go back to what we were. And Lee says, what about our promise? We promised to pay the, the debt of the South back in gold six months after the treaty was signed. So Grant says, oh dear, we don't have any money. We can't do that. What would we do? We can't cheat the people like that because we can't pay the war debt. That means we can't have a treaty of peace. And so they shook hands and rode away with the gentleman's agreement. That's why we don't have a peace treaty. They owed too much money to the international bankers to sign a treaty of peace because they didn't have money to pay the bankers back, much less pay the people that had faith in them and bought those bonds. We have never had a peace treaty, ever, to this day. <clears throat> The American people have been paying off the debt caused by the war bonds from that, from that time to this. The American people have been held under military occupation pursuant to Lincoln's general order in 1863. The payoffs have resulted in the following. The takeover by the government of private property. According to the government, we have to pay property taxes to keep possession of our property. The result is we do not own property. The issuance of military scrip. We, have, no, we no longer have money, the term we use for something of value. We, we are issued military scrip, which we can trade for goods and services. It's called Federal Reserve Notes. We no longer have rights, we have privileges. Those privileges are government issued and can be revoked at any time. All these lawful, illegal takings by men and women posing as governmental entities have been tolerated and upheld by the American people. We have been stripped and shorn of everything of value. This system is held in place by a system of beliefs. We believe the government is acting in our best interest. We believe if we don't pay taxes, we go to jail or, we, or they take our property. 
Folks, there is no government. All we have here are the powers that be. If there were, each and every government official, from municipal employees to the representatives and senators, would have taken the oath mandated by the Constitution at Article 6, to wit, I, blah, blah, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. I think we have often, I think perhaps we have begun to believe that that Constitution is nothing but a piece of paper. It is so important to our freedom and our values. We can never forget it. We have to refer to it at every turn. It is their, that's what they're liable for, the, the terms of that Constitution, those that, that would be governmental. Not one of them, at least in Texas, takes that oath. I have not found one single Article 6 oath in all the requests that I've done through the years. Not one. Not one of your elected officials is bound to support the Constitution. And more astonishing than that tidbit of information is, we allow them to get away with it. I have begun writing pleas to the jurisdiction before a court hearing. Here are a few of them. This is one that I put in for my son. He didn't have a driver license, and they were going to put him in jail for two years. That was the price he had to pay, two years in jail for not having a driver license, which is, we don't need anyway. <clears throat> he had been picked up and picked up and picked up for having no driver license, and he had beat everything except he, this one was appealed to the county court at law, and Bill Swaim, who is the special, special prosecutor of the county for the Travis County, had told him he was going to get two years and Swain was going to see that he got two years because he had, when this one went away, he had four more coming up and one way or another they were going to get him. He told him, I heard him say that to Craig. Okay, we're going to go over this because it's really important. This just, just clarifies what I'm talking about with the oaths. Comes now, Craig Robert Pease notices this court of the following. County Court at Law Number 9, County Court at Law Judge Williams, before assuming the duties of the office of County Court at Law Judge, was required to fi file the following documents in order to assume the office lawfully. Texas Constitution, Article 6, and, and the, that's, um, I mean, Article 16, Section 1, Texas Local Government Code 81.02. That has to do with the bond and oath. Texas Constitution, Article 6, Statement of the Officer, Texas Government Code 25006. They have to have bonds and oaths and, and the two state, the constitutional statements. And I didn't even know about the Article 6 oath. You can forget that's not even on here, but they for sure didn't have that. An officer who is required to give an official bond shall file the bond with the officer's oath of office. An officer who is required by law to give an official bond and who fails to execute the bond within the time prescribed by law may be removed from office. What it says is it has to be filed after they're elected and after January 1 of the following year and before they assume the duties of the office. They have a specific time frame. Their, their, their stuff can't be dated before January 1, although I always let the bond slide because I'm not sure about that. January 1 is the beginning of the regular term for county precinct officers elected in the previous general election in November. The, those elected officers are to qualify and assume the duty, I didn't know this was in here, sorry, it's redundant, duties of the office on or as soon as possible after January 1. Ms. Williams was appointed to the position of county court at law judge on March 22, 2016. You see, she was appointed, not elected. Ms. Williams signed the required bond in an amount of $10,000 payable to the county treasurer of Travis County on March 22, 2016, and signed the oath of office on the back of the bond on March 22, 2016. Ms. Williams, therefore, meets the statutory, statutory requirements of Texas Government Code 25006. However, a search of public records does not reflect the filing of the Texas Constitution Article 16, Section 1, Oath of Officer on Statement or statement of officer of Ms. Williams for the term from March 22, 2016. So when she was appointed, she put those two things in, the bond and the oath, the, the oath, but she didn't put the statement in. And what the Constitution, Texas Constitution says is, the Article 16 statement must be go in first. It has to be filed before the oath. So if they don't file a statement, the oath is no good because it has to be done in that order. 
public re record reflects that she did file a statement in oath of office on December 20th, 2016, allegedly for the term that was expiring. She tried to correct it. These documents must be filed when she was appointed and before she assumed the duties of the office. Therefore, Ms. Williams did not sit with constitutional authority from March 22nd, 2016 to December 31st, 2016. Kim Williams did not assume the office lawfully. Now, the reason I have her twice in here is because she was involved in a court with him before, which she found him guilty, their jury found him guilty. It was appealed to the, to the appellate court and reversed. So we had to include both her terms here. That's why she's in here twice. Ms. Williams was elected to the Office of County Court at Law Judge on November 8, 2016. Merchants Bonding Company issued a bond to Ms. Williams on November 2, 2016, six days before the election. The signature of Ms. Williams was notarized on the bond on November 28, 2016, after she was elected. The official bond must be filed with the officer's oath of office. Ms. Williams did not fill out the oath of office of county judge. Now, she did when she was appointed, but she didn't when she was elected. Although Sarah Eckert signed the bond on December 6, 8, 2016, showing the date the bond with no oath was approved in open commissioner's court. They can't do that. It's got to be in its entirety. It's both constitutional and statutory. <clears throat> the official bond must be filed with the officer's oath of office. Ms. Williams did not fill out the oath of office of county judge, although, oh, forget that. For the term beginning January 1, 2017 to December 31, 2021, Kimberly Williams did not meet the requirements of Texas Government Code 25.06, therefore she is not bonded. And one word about the bond, once upon a time when we had officials in this country, when they were really government officials, they had to own property to get elected and they had to pledge their property and it had to be a freehold. They had to own it free and clear. They had to pledge their property, their freehold to the people in the case of malfeasance. We have no bonds made out to the people in this day and age. They only make it out to the people, who they take money and they make it out to the people they have to pay the money to. That's the only bonds. It's, with, it's, it's all in house there. They, they owe nothing to us, nothing. Ms. Williams signed her constitutional oath of office and statement on January 1st, 2017. The statement must be filed before the oath and Ms. Williams did not take care to make certain that the statement was filed first. Also, the oath of office was sworn and subscribed by Nancy Hohengarten, who has, who, she's another county court at law judge, who has never filed an official bond with oath of office and therefore does not qualify as one who can test to an oath. You can't just look at these things, you gotta examine them and you gotta know what the rules are. And for anybody that really wants to make a study of this, there is a booklet put out by the Texas County Association of Counties. It's available online and they update it every year, every two years. And it tells every single piece of paper, with the exception of Article 6 U.S. Constitution Oath, that uh, an official in a county has to have. So this is, this is, uh, all you have to do is put official, I mean, uh, oath and, and bond Texas and this thing will pop up. And I always keep a paper copy because I use these a lot. Um, Ms. Williams had not met the criteria to sit as a lawful judge in Travis County and therefore has no authority to adjudicate whether or not I have a driver license. The requirements for an assistant county of attorney are Oath and statement. Mr. William Swain, senior special Travis County prosecutor, now and at the time he filed an information against me in 2016, filed a statement dated January 22, 2013, but failed to file a constitutionally prescribed oath. For the current term, which began January 1, 2017, when David S. Camellia, he's supposed to be the county attorney, was reelected in November 2016, Mr. Swain filed a statement as required together with an appointment, but failed to file a constitutionally required oath. Mr. Swain does not meet the criteria to act as a lawful assistant county prosecutor. I have great trepidation to even appear in an alleged court of law when I have knowledge and proof that the two main players in the room did not have competence, the competence to file the required documents that would cloak them with authority. These two, Kim Williams and William Swain, are attempting to incarcerate me for my religious beliefs and when they are not public officers and have not filed the required documents to cloak them with authority. 
I've totally lost, lost faith in the judicial system and as a result am in fear for my life. Magic words. So <clears throat> this, is, this is her first bond, Kimberly Williams, when she was appointed. You see on this one, when she didn't know what she was doing, she actually find the, filed the oath on the back. You'll see all of these oaths of office and not one of those is filled out. Not one on a bond, ever, except she was appointed and didn't know any different. So she filed the oath on the back. <clears throat> then her next filing was the oath of office on, at, that she signed when she was appointed, but there's no, oh, and here's, here's her statement, that's her appointment one. Now she comes to the elected, no oath on the back. This is one that the bond, they bonded her before she was elected. Um, this is her oath of office signed on January 17th, I mean 1st, 2017, followed by her statement backwards. The one has to be filed before the other, it's clear. And here's William Swain's oath of office. I mean, statement. He has an oath of office. This is, I think, if I remember what I read. But this is the statement of the elected officer. And here's his second statement, because we were doing two terms. And here's his appointment by, by Escamilla. And they do have an oath on the appointment. Um, but it's not, it doesn't, there's a word out of sync that, does, that doesn't qualify with the, the Texas Constitution at all. Therefore, there is no oath. It has to be word for word as it's put out in the Texas Constitution. These people take great care not to file the required oaths. Do you know what happened to Cray? When he put that in? He was discharged. They threw him from the courtroom. He said, I am removing you from the court. That's not a dismissal. I am removing you from the court, he said. And they don't want him back. And a couple of weeks later, when I looked on the charges, they had all the charges that were discharged. Not, that's almost the same as being extinguished because they'll dismiss, but the charges will stay there. He has no charges, because they're always money charges. You think you're being charged with no driver license. I promise you there's a ledger. That's what you're being charged with. You get to pay it. <clears throat> I, I repeat, not one of your elected officials is bound to support the Constitution. And more astonishing, we allow them to get away with that. Oh, the police is the jurisdiction. I've not yet found, oh, I wanted to say, show one closer to home, because this is Dr. McCann's plea to the jurisdiction in a lower court. And this is kind of the one I'm doing now. Michael McCann, a man, presents his plea to the jurisdiction in response to the citation issued to him on February 6, 2019, and gives notice of the following. Michael McCann has signed no contract to be bound by the Texas Transportation Code or the Texas Penal Code. Why does he have no contract? No driver license. No driver license. He never signed the contract. Michael McCann is not a man who can be pro presumed to be bound by the Texas Tra Transportation Code or Texas Penal Code. Michael McCann demands strict proof that this court has jurisdiction over a man who is not contracted to be bound by the Texas Transportation Code or Penal Code. Further, the justice presiding over this court has no authority to meet punishment to Michael McCann, a man. Sherry Kirsch, the justice who allegedly presides over this court, has failed to meet the criteria to assume the duties of the Office of Justice of Peace. Ms. Kirsch was elected to the office on November 6, 2018, in order to secure the blessings of the office and to sit in a de jure lawful capacity. Ms. Kirsch was required to fill out and file in public records certain oaths and bonds in order to legally and lawfully perform the duties of the office. The Texas Constitution <laughs> states that Texas is a free and independent state subject only to the Constitution of the United States. Texas Constitution, Article 1, Section 1. The Constitution of the United States of America 
Article 6, Clause 3 states, and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by author affirmation to support this Constitution. The oath enumerated in the U.S. Constitution can now be found in 5 U.S.C. 1331. Ms. Keith has failed to take said oath. The Texas Constitution at Article 16 mandates that blah, blah, we've been through that. Ms. Ms. Kirsch failed to file the Texas Constitution Article 16C Statement of Officer. The statement referenced above must be filed before the Texas Constitutional Oath of Office can be filed. Ms. Kirsch failed to file the required statement. Therefore, the Oath of Office which she filed is not relevant as she failed to follow instructions. A public official, in order to be cloaked with the requirements of office, must take several oaths and blah, blah, blah. We've been through that. She failed to file them. Ms. Kirsch has no jurisdiction to sit in the position she appears to hold. As one of the people, Michael McCann gives Ms. Kirsch notice that because she was not competent to fill out and file the doc necessary documents, which would allow her to sit as a justice of the peace, that she shall immediately remove herself from office. The people of the Republic of the United States of America and Texas will no longer tolerate usurpation of officers subject to election. And we filed one of these for Tom, and Tom, what happened with yours? What was that? We filed one of these, pleaded, wasn't it wasn't it with this same judge? We yes, filed? same judge, and, and uh, everything was dismissed because I did what you gave me. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I went ahead, took your paperwork, and, and looked up her oath of office, which was missing. And of course, they would never give you any indication they were uh, paying any attention at all. Of a sudden, I get this letter back. It's been dismissed. Yeah, we have to shine the lights on these rats. Um, I have not yet found a single U.S. Constitutional Article 6 of for anyone in Texas. Everything we allow these government officials to do to us is legal and lawful. You understand that, don't you? Whatever they do to us is legal and lawful. Why? We, we volunteer for all the abuse and therefore cannot complain. And if we can't complain that we didn't get full disclosure or any of those other things, what do they say? Ignorance of the law is no excuse. We, our consent is our contract with the usurpers. We allow them to govern us in any manner they see fit to impose. Where are we at this stage of the game in history? We are in bondage. We look no further, further than the Lieber Code. Lincoln's General Order 100. Has everybody read this? No. This is almost as important as the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln said in 1863, April 1863, yeah, I, the reason we're filming is this. I want you to watch this over and over because I want you to grasp every concept in here and you're, you're not going to be able to do it in one speech. You're going to have to look at this stuff until you understand it and it becomes part of your bone marrow. A place, district, or country occupied by an enemy. And who's the enemy? We are. We are. In consequence of the occupation under the martial law of the invading or occupation army, whether any proclamation declaring martial law or any public warning to the inhabitants has been issued or not, martial law is the immediate and direct effect in consequence of occupation or conquest. All those years you were fighting that flag with the gold fringe on it, what, what was it a sign of? Slavery. Military occupation, military courts. The martial law does not cease during the, the hostile occupation except by special proclamation either ordered by the commander in chief or by special mention in the treaty of peace. <clears throat> I wrote a letter that was supposed to have gotten to President Trump and I asked him to do this very thing. All I can think is it didn't get to him. Concluding the war when the occupation of a place or territory continues beyond the conclusion of peace is one of the conditions of the same. Well, we haven't had that, have we? You see this occupation, except here's the treaty of peace again. Occupation, 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 okay? 
then if that if you don't read we are this is for us this is the handbook that they use to oppress us so if that's not enough for you there's a book written by William Whiting he was a solicitor general this is war powers under the Constitution of the United States and it's written by uh, William Whiting who was the solicitor general under Lincoln it's a huge sloggy tome let me tell you my son has read it six times I just took his word for what he read <laughs> except now I have it chapter by chapter well William what William Whiting says about the law administered by military governments we're talking our courts now we're talking our laws as the powers of a de facto government see they can sit de facto that is a government government a military government over us is de facto and they can sit de facto everybody know de facto they are not lawful belong to the conqueror by the laws of war he may suspend modify or abrogate all municipal laws of those whom he has conquered he may dis and how did they conquer us with, with with the order but how else with the dollar and it's them that conquered us the, mili the the bankers he may disregard their former civil rights and remedies he may introduce and enforce a new code of laws military and municipal and may carry them into effect by new military tribunals having abolished all courts and offices held under the authority of his enemy we have no legitimate courts especially civil courts well criminal too in this land none they are all military in nature it has been held by the supreme court this is the solicitor general saying this it has been held by the supreme court that the laws whether in writing or evidenced by the usage and customs of the conquered or ceded country continue in force till altered by the new sovereign who will that new sovereign be the people we will be the people as one unit will be the new sovereign there is only one sovereign and he doesn't live here we are subject to a sovereign but when you're talking about political sovereignty you're talking about the people as a body of one there is nothing more powerful nothing all these propositions follow from the fact that the power of a public enemy to make or administer law is terminated by the conquest of their territory by different lawmaking and jaw administer and law administer jaw <laughs> law administering power vis-a-vis -vis that of the conqueror but no laws or institutions established by law are permitted to survive which are in conflict with those of the conqueror the suppression of the present rebellion is not the conquest of a foreign country the citizens of the United States residing in the districts in rebellion are not alien enemies though they are public enemies we are public enemies and it is important in several points of view to observe the distinction between enemies who are subjects of a foreign government and are therefore called alien enemies and those who are denizens and subjects of the United States and being engaged in civil war are called public enemies. An alien owes no allegiance or obedience to our government or to our constitution, laws, or proclamations. A citizen subject is bound to obey them all. And when you're talking there, they mean the military. In refusing such obedience, he is guilty of crime against his country and finds in the law of nations no justification for disobedience. And that, that document is called War Powers? That document that I just read you is from William Whiting. I have, I have William Whiting broken down into chapters that anybody's willing to, go to, to email me and get. And it's the only way you can read William Whiting. The book is that thick in small print. And it's really, really laborious reading. War Powers Under the Constitution of the United States by William Whiting. It's available from the Smithsonian. You can get it in, in uh, ebook. Um, I have it on my iPad. But the best way to read it is broken down chapter by chapter, which I, a friend sent me a while ago, thank God. 
Um, I wanted to point, let me see if that's in the Constitution. <coughs> he said it's punishable by the law of nations, okay? The law of, na the law of nations, does anybody know where that, what the law of nations is? International. That's international law, and it has to be upheld by every, everybody. And at Article 1, Section 8 in the Constitution, it says the Congress shall have, shall have power to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. So when these dudes commit an offense against, against the law of nations, they can be punished. It's, it's a crime internationally, and I'm going to show you how you can do that. Yes, sir. Does he? Uh, isn't it against international law to occupy a country, to continue to occupy it? There's a certain amount of time and they must release it? No. No? No. No. Uh, they can stay with military power as long as they want to. It's called a dictatorship. How many dictatorships get earth over overthrown on a regular basis or called time out? Anybody who, here's the, here's the way the law of nations works. If you have two factions in one country and one, doesn't, one faction doesn't like the other faction, they can wage war against the one they don't like. And the victor gets the spoils. Normally, there's a peace treaty after such a battle. And, and then the, like, um, we fought a war, we didn't like what, what uh, George was doing to us and we fought a revolutionary war not on his property, but on ours. And we were fighting for our land. And when it was over and George conceded that he had lost and there was a surrender, there was a peace treaty after that. And in that peace treaty, um, George gave us back everything. He gave us all the land, not only in the colonies, but he had claimed the land to the Mississippi River. And he, he gave us back that land to the Mississippi River and that land, those lands, that territory was not under a compact like the Articles of Confederation or the, or the colonies. They were separate states and, and George gave them back their land, but he also gave the land to the Mississippi, which was a territory. And so the United States had to write the book of the Northwest Ordinance to, to, to put it in the rules and regulations concerning the territories. And in that book, it says, if 60,000 people get together in the same area and want to carve a state out of that territory, they have to petition Congress for the state, they have to create a constitution, and they have to set meets and bounds boundaries uh, on the land that they want, submit it to Congress, and then Congress can grant them statehood. And Article 4 of the Constitution deals with disposing of that land. It's called dispose. If anybody's ever listened to Cliven Bundy, I didn't know this until I heard Cliven, and I'm a constitutional scholar who figured. So on, in Article 4 of the Constitution, it deals with the, the rules and regulations under the Northwest Ordinance. It dispose, it, it's out of the territories. Cliven Bundy makes the, the statement that he doesn't pay the federal government because on, he's not on federal land. He lives in Clark County, Nevada. And it used to be, before it was Nevada and before it was Clark County, Nevada, it was the territory of Arizona. And I think, I can't remember the year it was done. Uh, I think it was 1864, something like that. Um, the United States disposed of the state, the, the, the land that is now Nevada. And when they dispose of it, they have nothing more to do with it. The government can own no land except for that which is ceded to them. Before this country, before, when, after we beat back George, we, the government bought all the ports along the eastern seaboard. They bought them and they were ceded to them by the process that the government can buy land. The government can buy land for forts and arsenals and other places. They needed to own the ports because that was gonna be the revenue for the United States. They, had to, they owned the ports, the, the ships sailed into the ports. They wanted to do business in the United States. There, there was an IRS officer, the real function of one, who went aboard, assessed the, the, the uh, goods that were to be imported into the United States, 
assessed a, a, an amount against him for duties and impost and exposts and duty taxes, and the ship owner paid the IRS revenue agent, then they can be brought into the country. That's how the government was to be supported. So the government bought and was ceded every port along the eastern seaboard so they could have the revenue to run the United States. That's how small it was supposed to be, and that's how it was to be paid for. Americans were never to pay for this government. But the law of nations is important uh, because all countries are bound by that. And it is, has anybody ever read Vittel's? That's the only one I've read is Vittel's Law of Nations. It's kind of dog eat dog until you set the rules. But I, I wonder, the Northwest Ordinance is an example of the rules and regulations that have to, that everybody has to have rules and regulations. We have to know where we stand. And the Northwest Ordinance is the rules, are the rules, of, the Northwest Ordinance is the uh, compilation of the rules and regulations pertaining to territories. Now they treat us like territories. We're not. We are a conquered, conquered land. Um, the, okay, we look to the Libra Code for, for our occupation. We look to the Libra Code, Lincoln's General Order 100, or to William Whiting the, Whiting, the Solicitor General of the United States under Lincoln. And anybody is welcome to email me and I'll send you those files. They are really gut-wrenching. They hurt my heart. They're hard to read. It's a horrible thing. But that's the law, according to the military. Or to the Reconstruction Acts. Because the Reconstruction Acts were passed in 1867 and have never been lifted. We are living in an occupied country, as in military occupation. The taxes we pay are not ad valorem taxes, as they would have you believe, but occupation taxes. Notice what it says in the Texas Constitution. But before I bring this slide up, I have to tell you that I listened to this dude called, I can't remember what he's called, but he sure as hell knows the law. He's out of Canada. And I always get a different take on the law and how it goes when I listen to him. And he explained why the municipalities retain an, the, the, the major deed when they, when uh, an, an un, un, un a, a property goes in to the county to have a plat come out, and the plat comes out in lots and lots and blocks. It went in as meets and bounds. It comes out in lots and blocks. In in um, Canada, there is the the law of titles, title of the land or whatever, um, says that the munici municipality retains the main deed, and they give a subsidiary deed to you, a conditional deed, and that conditional deed has the conditions like you have to pay the taxes that they owe. So they pass that on to you. That's how it is in Canada. So I had this theory in my mind, and I had a RICO ca case for property in Bastrop. So I decided to go over to Bastrop County and look, look for myself to see if I couldn't make that fit into my scheme of things. Typical thing of taking a round block and trying to shove it into a square hole. But I was trying to see if that's what happened here in Texas, because I've never been able to figure out the, 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 the property taxes. So I go over to there, and the clerk is really helpful, and I'm looking at everything, and I get, I get the plat of the, of the property that I'm dealing with. And interestingly enough, I think if we don't have meets and bounds, you can go to the city and get your plat, and it's got GPS coordinates all around your property. I think you can use those as a description instead of the lots and blocks, which is the land that belongs to them. So I couldn't make it fit. I was just getting, I mean, I looked and looked and looked. I looked at deeds. I looked at succession. I looked at all that stuff. I couldn't, fit, I couldn't make it fit. So I went over to the assessor's office, and I asked to go in the back room and look at the tax books. I went back there, and, and they said, well, we don't, we don't have them all because we had a courthouse fire in 1850. So I, I said, oh, I, well, I, you know, I want after that. So I went in there, and this room is fill, filled with the tax books. And I said, could I have your earliest property tax book? And she pulls off the shelf. 1876 is the first year that they collected property tax in Bastrop County. And now I know that that's the year that they passed the ad valorem tax bill that said ad valorem taxes can only be taxed to banks, bankers, and corporations. 
I know that the people do not pay ad valorem taxes. So I knew that. I just find it really strange. In the Constitution that we use, <clears throat> by the way, this is the allegedly the Texas Constitution. A Constitution can never be revised. <laughs> it has to be externally amended. And what is this? We have the state of Texas seal up here, and it says it's the Texas Constitution. But I think the state of Texas seal kind of overrides the fact that it's a Texas Constitution. Can't be both. It's one or the other. It's this, these are the bylaws of the state of Texas. Um, if, if you want to use a, a Texas Constitution, you have to go back to 1845 and say 1845 Constitution as amended and use, use the concessions in there. So anyway, uh, I know that's the year. First, they sat in Austin, and in the spring, they made this 1876 Constitution. Then they took a break, and they came back, and the first bill that they passed was this ad valorem tax bill, where only banks, bankers, and corporations have to pay. Men and women don't. So I get out this 1876 tax book, and it's about yay big, and so you open it up, and it, name over here, and it goes across, and you got columns, and over here is the tax they paid, the property tax. So I'm looking at it, and over here, it's got a, we have blanks in here, nothing across the line. So I look at it, and I look over here, and that's a corporation. And I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? These are men and women. Corporations pay nothing. What is it? I just really was perplexed. So I went home to my son, and I said, he is the expert on war powers, and I said to him, let me tell you what I just saw. I can't resolve this. And he said, well, mother, you weren't looking at property taxes. You were looking at the occupation, occupation taxes. And I said, occupation taxes? He said, yes, occupation taxes. That's what you were paying. That's what those people were paying. And corporations didn't have to pay the occupation taxes, only the citizens. So I thought, well, how can I justify that with the Texas Constitution? So I look at the taxes and revenue section of the Constitution again, and gee, what does it say? It says it's Article 8, taxation and revenue. We skip to here, the legislature may provide for the taxation of intangible property and may also impose what? Occupation, Occupation taxes, both upon natural persons and upon corporations other than municipal doing business in this state. I never saw that. In all the 15 years I've been fiddling with property taxes, I never saw that. Everything in the United States Army Manual, the Libra Code, the Reconstruction Acts, give us the rules of occupation. And every one of these documents tells us the occupation ceases when we have peace. Will the powers that be ever broker a peace deal with the American people? No. Only if they are forced to do so. Who has the power to force Congress to recognize a state of peace? The people. We the people, and we never have. We never have. Who helped do this to us? As you saw from William Whiting's writings, the courts are not courts of peace. They are operated under war powers. Still, they appear to be the people's courts until the ad they still they appeared to be the people's courts until the advent of the bar. In Texas, the legislature passed the Texas Bar Act in 1939. From that point to this, the people have been systematically squeezed from the courts in civil cases and charged with untold charges in so-called criminal charges cases. The attorneys are believed to be licensed to practice law in this state. Is there a law license? No. 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 Is, there, is it in the occupation code? No. There is no license. They get a certificate that says this certificate allows you to apply for a license. There is no licensing board. There is no way to get a license, but they call it license, OK? Um, the attorneys are believed to be licensed to practice law in this state. In this case, in this state, is not Texas. So where are they practicing their law? Columbia. Everything says in this state. That ain't us, boys. We're in Texas. 
People exercising their rights require no license of any kind, not driving, not law, not anything. The judges, the judges are merely attorneys in black robes. The attorneys are masters of attornment. What does that word mean? And seldom care about their clients. We could not be in this mess if it hadn't been for attorneys. They have ruined our judicial system and sacrificed the people on their altar bar, their bar altar. Early in the 1800s, the government must have known the dangers attorneys pose for this country because the 13th Amendment was proposed by the 11th U.S. Congress on May 1st, 1810. When I first found the 13th Amendment, I got a copy of it from, from the laws of Virginia. This isn't in, I can't find it. And we brought it into Texas. We had it certified by the archives down somewhere around Texas, and it is in their archives. So the 13th Amendment, as it was written, is in Texas. That's what you do to bring a, a, something that they don't have on their shelves in. We did the proper thing and we brought it in. Article 13. If any citizen of the United States shall accept, claim, receive, or retain any title of nobility or honor, or shall without the consent of Congress, and Congress isn't, isn't uh, capitalized. Wow, consent of Congress. In that case, it would be a Congress of people. Never notice that. Accept and retain any present pension, office, or emollient of any kind whatever, from any emperor, king, prince, or foreign power, such person shall cease to be a citizen of the United States, that's when it wasn't a, a deadly thing, and shall be incapable of holding any office of trust or profit under them or either of them. Now, what this has been interpreted to mean is no attorney can hold a public office. Okay? What happened to the 13th Amendment? Probably good. They broke it up and moved it into other places in the Constitution. I switched it out on the holiday weekend. No. They claimed it wasn't ratified by enough states. That's what they claimed. Place. However, okay, what a different world we would have now if that amendment had remained published. What happened was the amendment had, oh, um, I went too far. Records incorrectly show the amendment was never ratified, but in fact it was, and somebody found it in the Library of Congress. Ratification took far longer to accomplish in the days before internet, and it was, an, it was until about 1817 that the 13th Amendment was ratified. In 1820, all existing laws of the United States were reprinted to reflect the addition of the 13th Amendment. The amendment has been interpreted to mean that no esquire, the title given attorneys, can hold public office. And now, what a different world we would have if that remained. But you see, this is done by the 13th colony. Again, it, it took about, to about 1817, I, I have that figure somewhere, to be ratified. But look at this book. It still has it in this book. And it's the laws of Colorado in 1867. It's also in a book in the archives of Maine, written for the children of Maine to educate them as to the Constitution of the United States or the United States of America and the Maine Constitution. Well, in 1820, every, 1820, every publication in every state and the Army Manual published, republished their laws, the laws of Virginia with the Constitution of the United States and the 13th Amendment because it had to be published. And so in 1820, every single law book in the country republished itself to include the 13th Amendment. It was ratified. It is on there. <clears throat> was it signed by the Secretary of State or the President? What? Was the 13th Amendment ratified by the Secretary of State? By the states. It has to be ratified by the states. When, when an amendment goes out, the states have to sign on to it. It has to be ratified by X number of states, probably two-thirds, and then it's an amendment. And then the U.S. Secretary of State signs it when all that's done. Well, they, like, like the, the Secretary of State for Texas is supposed to sign off on the laws that pass the legislature, too, do they? Yeah. Probably in that day they did. They don't. So the 16th Amendment 
it was signed without it being fully read. Well, anything after the original 13th is bunk, okay? Um, the 12th Amendment, the one prior to the 13th, was adopted on September 25th, 1804. The 13th, sometime in 1817, and it was printed over, printed over after December 18th, 1865, when the current 13th Amendment was adopted. It was simply printed over. Just like uh, they're reprinting history now, aren't they? I mean, we never did anything in the South except be dogs and murders and rapists, and they're deleting us from the history. We live in the Orwellian world today. You know, it's definitely Orwellian. The corruption of the courts has grown exponentially since the bar became a legislated union. The bar is a union in violation of antitrust act. The, the bar is managed by the Supreme Court. The rules for the court are promulgated by the Supreme Court. The system is one in which there is no outside oversight and it stands in defiance of separation of powers. The institution of the bar and the corruption of the attorneys has has all but decimated the First Amendment. We have no redress of grievance anymore and no way to hold the government accountable. They build magnificent temples to, our, our, to their gods at our expense, where the motto is courage, perseverance, sacrifice. Guess who the lambs are? That's over the Travis County Courthouse with, the, with Zeus up there and be putting people in bondage. That's the purpose of these courts. What did we miss? And the truth shall set you free from ignorance and error and the prejudices of education under which the whole nation labors and from the thraldom of the law. That's my favorite translation of John 8, 32. Thraldom, the state of being a thrall, bondage, slavery, servitude. The truth shall make you free. We just have to speak the truth. You have no rights unless you claim them and use them. Got to stand up for them. But first we have to know the truth. Were we ever taught in our public schools about our freedoms, liberties, and the rights of the people? Well, I'm from Utah. We were. And I'm old. We were. Back in the old days. Covered wagon, all that stuff. Perhaps it's because in our lifetimes we have been under occupation and the powers that be didn't want us to know the truth. Do you all know what the law of nations is? We've already discussed that. It's mentioned in the Constitution. We already saw that. Do you know that the law of nations talks about natural rights? The rights we have simply because we are men on earth? Natural rights are rights granted to all people by nature or God and cannot be denied or restricted by any government or individual. Natural rights are often said to be granted to people by natural law. Do you know how to express or execute your natural rights? Nobody... I, we're supposed to have the right of self-determination. Wait, we're coming to that. Good, no. good thought. No, don't wait. I, I like to hear that. Legal rights are rights granted by governments or legal systems. John Locke, your favorite, believed that fundamental rights are life, liberty, and property. He believed that the most basic human law of nature is the preservation of mankind. To serve that purpose, he reasoned, individuals have both a right and a duty to preserve their own lives. We're living a life under somebody else's terms now. We have to have our own lives. What does the Texas Constitution mandate that the free public schools are to teach? You know, there's an educational mandate in the Texas Constitution or state of Texas. Article seven, education, the public free schools. 
A general diffusion of knowledge being essential to the preservation of the liberties and rights of the people, it shall be the duty of the legislator of the state to establish and make suitable provision for the support and maintenance of an efficient system of public free schools. And what is the purpose of those schools? A diffusion of knowledge being essential to the preservation of liberties and rights of the people. You think you're teaching them? Do we currently have a constitutional education system? Is anyone here aware of the International Covenant on Civil Rights, Civil and Political Rights? Vaguely. Huh? Vaguely. Well, you better get unvague on that, baby, because it's going to save your, you know what. This is, it is a treaty. It's an international covenant on political and civil rights. Everybody should carry it, just like the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> this was adopted, oh, I find this interesting. Adopted and signed for signature ratification and accession by General Assembly on the 16th of December, 1966, and entered on in 1977 in force. In accordance with Article 9, We'll have to come back to this in a second, but here's the thing. Bush sent a thing in 1996 to the Congress and said, please sign this treaty. Okay, in 1992, excuse me, Bush sent a letter. First of all, a treaty oh, this covenant, uh, I'll get to, here's the report, okay. Um, the Committee on Foreign Relations, adopted unanimously by the United Nations, talks about the covenant, adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on December 7, 1966, and signed on behalf of the United States on October 1977. They thought about it a while, didn't they? Well, you know, there were four um, human rights conventions that the UN, UN adopted. This is, I think there's only one, and this is it. They don't want us really to be part of that, I think. The purpose, the covenant guarantees a broad spectrum of civil and political rights rooted in basic democratic values and freedoms to all individuals within the territory or under the jurisdiction of the state's party. That would be the United States of America. Without distinction of any kind, such as race, gender, ethnicity, et cetera, the covenant obligates each state party, the United States of America, to respect and ensure these rights to adopt legislation or other necessary measures to give effect to these rights and to provide an effective remedy to those whose rights are violated. They put a caveat on this. The Senate passed this, but it made it non-self-executing. Articles 1 through 27 of the Covenant, the Senate said were not self-executing. Now, what do you think that means? We don't have access to it. Like the Bill of Rights, is that, okay, the, let's say, let's talk about the, the, the four books, the Declaration of Independence, the, you know, blah, blah, blah. Are those self-executing? Yes, we are entitled to every right in those books. Those are self-executing. Is the Bill of Rights self-executing? Yes, we have the rights under the Bill of Rights. It says the covenant is not self-executing. And there's a reason for that. All peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of their right, they freely de determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. All peoples may, for their own ends, freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources without prejudice to any obligations arising out of international economic cooperation based upon the principle of mutual benefit and international law. Here, for instance, is an affidavit that I prepared for me. I haven't had the time to go down and file it. Um, it says that I'm giving notice that I accept and embrace the principles in the International Covenant, thus executing the principles for my use and enjoyment. I give public notice that I claim and exercise my rights under the International Covenant. You can do that. Or I have another solution in a minute. In this country, a treaty, uh, a treaty 
is adopted by law as a as law by a proposal from the president. The president suggests the UN does a treaty. The president suggests that we do the treaty, and then it's ratified by the Senate. In this instance, the Senate made the reservation that Articles 1 through 27 were not, not self-executing. If you, as a man or woman, choose to exercise your rights under the covenant, you must claim them and declare them to be executed for you. The truth is, armed with both the declaration, this is the truth, the one that will make you free, armed with both the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the International Covenant, we become a force with which to be reckoned. Article 2 of the Covenant frees us from taxation. The term principle of mutual benefit is the old Rob Peter to pay Paul principle. Or, as Karl Marx said, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. When executed, the incorporation of the covenant frees you from taxation. The alleged purpose of taxation, in addition to enslaving us and charging for the enslavement or occupation, is allegedly for the public welfare or general good. These are the tenets of communism. The real purpose is to keep us in bondage. When I execute the covenant for myself, I give notice that I am free to dispose of my natural wealth and resources and free from contributing to the principles of mutual benefits. In other words, I'll keep what I earn and the, and the next man can do the same. Or he can do with his whatever he wants. I just don't choose to give mine away. When the covenant is executed, the United States is bound by international treaty, law of nations, to make the, take the necessary steps to adopt, adopt such laws or other measures as may, may be necessary, necessary to give effect to my rights. The federal government has to put in place laws that protect my rights under the International Covenant when I claim them. Should the parties to the covenant, that's the United States of America, right, not ensure that my rights are protected, it or they are committing an offense under the law of nations. And do we see that's punishable? Yeah, we saw that. Perhaps we need to revisit the sixth article of the United States, of the US Constitution, to once again enumerate our strengths. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary not standing. Those laws of the lands cannot be overridden by anyone. To make certain that they are bound to support those laws, Article 6, Section 3 says, the senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. And no religious test shall, oh, forget that. That doesn't matter. And you know what they do? They put, so help me God, on the end of the oath they take. And it says, no religious test. Uh, these guys just can't follow. And there's always a loophole. They always leave themselves a way out. Once we have <clears throat> familiarized ourselves with the laws of the land and understand our rights, we need to stop the usurpation of our court system and do away with the current political system. If we want to continue to support political parties and elect judges and politicians to rule over us and make rules and regulations which restrict our rights, we can at least exercise some power by saying no. No oath, no office. No oath, no office. And there, none of them have an oath. And mean it. What did I tell you guys last time I saw you? Take your cardboard box into the judge and tell him to get out of your office. It's not his. Think about what we are doing and to what we have become accustomed. We elect local, county, state, and federal governments. Each of these layers has ordinances, codes, statutes, and restrictions we must follow.
These governments meet daily or weekly or monthly or every other year and make more rules and regulations to restrict our freedom. What else are they doing? And we, we condone that? That's insanity. And these governments, why do we need this many governments who offer nothing but threats to our freedoms? We are merely supporting a system that takes from us and keeps on taking. We pay their salaries when many of us don't even have jobs. We pay their perks. We pay their retirements, and they are the ones who declare how much, dictated how much the retirements would be. Many positions, such as a city government or elected official, pay retirement after one term of office. We are in the private sector, and if we get a retirement, yet we work to pay for ours. I mean, we work to pay for theirs. We get no retirement, we pay for theirs. Let's look at two dudes we know pretty well here in Texas. John Cornyn. He was a district judge for four years. He got $6,000 retirement for that. Four years retirement, $6,000. That's 500 bucks a month for sitting for four years. Not a problem. He was a judge in the fourth district, the fourth judicial district, the appellate court, for two years. He was a judge in the Texas Supreme Court for eight years. He gets $48,000 for those two, those, that 10 years. And he was a Texas AG for three years. He gets $10,132 from that. Three years, $10,000 a year retirement. Not, not a problem. He's collected that since that $10,000 since 2006. But once he went left Texas and went to the Senate, he collects it all now. It's $65,383 a year he gets for less than 20 years work. Not bad. And now he makes $174,000 per year as a senator. And what will that retirement be? That's right. That's what it will be. Rick Perry. He was five years as an Air Force officer. He was six years as a Texas representative. He was eight years as the agriculture commissioner. He was one year as lieutenant governor, and he was 14 years as governor. But while he was still a sitting governor, he decided that he needed to take his retirement, which he could do because of the law that Bob Bullock passed. And so in, in 2011, four years before he retired as governor, or he was retired, whatever, he collects $92,376 a year. And now he gets paid for whatever held position he holds now that he doesn't ever go to a meeting. He knows all about it, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, he knows all about it. Well, it, it, it's wrong. I mean, I, I went to this Temple of the Gods up in, in, in Williamson County, biggest courthouse I've ever seen. I mean, biggest courtroom. I mean, you could have, Supreme Court doesn't have a, a, a courtroom that size. And I mean, the United States Supreme Court the lady that got the first, they paid 19, $17 million for that building that houses the JP and the constable. $17 million. And she, the lady that sits on the bench that got to move to the new building was a police officer for Round Rock for 20 years. So guess how much she gets paid besides $126,000 a year she gets for being a JP. And yet, our chief judge, Nathan Hecht, went before this, the, the uh, 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 hearing the other day and said that, that uh, district, I mean, judges need to be paid more in the state of Texas because they're just making mere nothing. $126,000 a year for a JP. $17 million for their temple. I mean, come on, this is insanity. Somebody voted him in. Somebody okayed the bonds. Everybody went along with it. This is what we do to ourselves. We do not need this many governments who offer nothing but threats to our freedoms. We are merely supporting a system that takes from us and keeps on taking. 
Okay, why? Think about the political process in this country. How big an industry is it really? There are candidates who are running for offices. I mean, they're prolific. I mean, they run for dog catcher. No, that's pointed, I think. They run for all kinds of positions. And they campaign. And they raise funds. And they make promises. These campaign funds can run into the millions of dollars for one candidate. Barack Obama spent half a, million, half a billion dollars the first time he ran for president for a $400,000 a year job. Does this make sense to anybody? Well, they anybody? Put, they put the remainder of their advertisements and campaign into their retirement fund. No, into their pocket. Well, yeah, into the retirement fund. Yeah, they keep what they make. They keep what they get in campaign funds. What is the matter with us? I mean, Beto announces he's going to run for president. What chance does Beto have making it as president? $6.4 million in 24 hours. What the hell are people financing in this country? Funding. Uneducated. The people of America are uneducated. There is no correlation between the amount of money spent and the salary of the job that is won. It doesn't make sense. People who vote, and it is getting to be fewer and fewer of those, that's another thing about our system. It doesn't matter how few turn up at the polls, they count it as an election and the dude walks away. He might have 4% of the vote. In Europe, they say, nobody made it. It's, it's, a, it's a no confidence vote by the people. They didn't show up, so nobody gets anything. What the hell is the matter with us? We can't do that. Come on. 2%, 4%, 14% of the people are obligating us to, 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 to debt? How do we allow this? Because they all work for the government. Now they do, don't they? And if not, we pay them Section 8 housing and all the, you know. People who vote, <clears throat> and it's getting to be fewer and fewer of them, take elections seriously. Look at the candidates and make selections or vote straight ticket for one of the two huge corporations whose business it is to keep us distracted. Who are these candidates? What are these offices? And what happens when the dust settles? Every part, every election is part of the system. What does the system do? It keeps us distracted. Allegedly, it gives us hope. Every election cycle, we hope we can vote and make a difference. A difference about what? The reality is we are wasting time and money in order to put some other dude in a position to make ordinances, rules, and regulations that we don't need and do nothing but restrict our rights and freedoms. What is the matter with us? Do these people need to sit? What do we have? We have the law of the land, the supreme law of the land. That regulates everything. And it is not rules and regulations. We don't need any of those. We only need law. There's a court ruling that says that rules, regulations, ordinances, and uh, I don't remember what else are not the law. Well, they're not, but we believe they are. It's all belief system. Right. Every single elected body who sits, be it city, county, state, or federal, makes it their job to continually lay down a barrage of laws. What do those laws do, and why do we need them? Those rules and regulations are put in place to restrict our rights and freedoms. We look at Article 6 of the Constitution, which was written in 1787. What does it tell us besides Congress shall meet at least once a year and we have all the laws that we need? What are we doing? If Congress only had to meet at least one day a year, what the hell did they do when they got together? Hey, how's it going in your neck of the woods, John? Oh, great. How about you? I said, oh, everything's okay. Okay, see you next year. They, it's not to meet in session. Fight carbon crap, carbon, uh, uh, whatever it is they do. It's disgusting. It's pure insanity. We know the system is broken and can't be fixed. What can we do? What should we do? There is only one answer. We have to change the system. The people are helpless because if there is a problem, they go to the people who caused the problem. Anita, you just told me the other day you wrote your congressperson, right? Yesterday. 
yesterday to solve a problem, to get help with the problem. And what did I tell you? You're a woman that's fixed other things, fix it yourself. I mean, it's futile to write to these people. They never answer, they don't care. If I had 700,000 people carping at me, I guess I wouldn't care either. <clears throat> there is a problem and they can't go to the people who caused the problem, the politicians. The American people have never once, as a single body, issued a plebiscite. Now is the time. What's a plebiscite? by an electorate. Okay, let's say that you're gonna vote. What are you gonna vote for? You're gonna vote in a plebiscite. America and the several states which have formed since the inception of the Republic and her people, this is what's on the webpage, have pretended to believe the myth that they can vote and make a difference. The truth is we were meant to choose our representatives and each representative could represent no more than 30,000 people. This could, would have constituted a republic. In other words, a republic being a state in which supreme power is held by the people and their elected representatives and which has an elected or nominated president rather than a monarch. We the people are no longer represented by anyone, much less career politicians. Our freedoms are gone, our liberties encumbered, and we have no chance of voting our way out of this mess and getting back to the republic. You can't vote yourself out of the system except one way. Unless, I said unless, we take matters into our own hands. Not by opting for one major corporation or another. That would be the Republican or Democratic Party. Not by compromising our unalienable rights and living in fear. We must vote our way out. You, read, you heard that right. We'll vote your way out our way out. We the people have never drawn up and issued a plebiscite to the governments we have instituted among men. We have not used our power. We can't wait any longer or there truly will be nothing left to save. We are in exactly the same position as our ancestors. We are suffering from taxation without representation. Those of us who attempt to exercise our natural rights have to endure tra traffic stops, arrests, and bogus charges against us. This must end. I would like every American who is suffering because the rules and regulations promulgated by representatives and legislators to restrict our rights are eating out our substance to stop this abuse. And to top this mess off, a lot of us believe these guys who have usurped our power are about to go to major war again. We're going to war again, you know, against Iran. We're run by hawks. Captain America, our Secretary of State, is nothing but a war hawk. And he wants war with Iran. And that other guy, I don't even know who these people are anymore. Pompeo, I know, because my, my son knew him in Berlin. But the other guy, his name starts with a B. Who would that be? That's the one. These two guys, John Bolton, these two guys are going to take our country to war again against Iran. Have you not had enough of that shit? I mean, really? Have you not had enough war? We'll never heal, recover, and have a future when we are kept in perpetual war. Isn't that the intent of the bankers? Where do they make their major money, boys? Keeping us in war and in bondage. That makes money for the bankers and politicians and takes from us, our children and grandchildren. Join us, the lovers of liberty, the believers in the Declaration of Independence, the protectors of peace. Add your name to this plebiscite and issue a direct vote from the American people that will put an end to the war, allow you to keep your own wealth and let us live in peace and prosperity. Please send this message to everyone you know. This is again what's on the website. We need massive numbers in order to do this. And don't forget to give whatever donation you can afford. I determined that I can't do this by myself without money. It will be expensive to send this proclamation far and wide and convince the professional politicians that their era has ended. Join in, cast your vote, vote and God bless America. This is the plebiscite. The People's Plebiscite. 
Unbeknownst to the American people, we became a conquered people after the War of Northern Aggression, commonly referred to as a civil war. It was not a civil war. The definition of a civil war is two or more factions fighting each other for one piece of land. The South seceded from the Union of States and created its own country and government, the Confederate States of America. The North fought the South to keep that from happening and to force them to be one federal government, not two nations. During this conflict, over 620,000 Americans died. To this day, few understand why the war was initiated and what the outcome was. The war of Northern aggression was fought to destroy the liberties of the only free people on earth at the time. Do you hear what I said? The only free people on earth at the time, the only people who could own property were here. The people lived, for the most part, in the several states. Those states had laws and operated, operated under rule of law. The war was initiated to destroy states' rights, impose military law on the land, impose perpetual debt, and implement the Reconstruction Acts on the people of the United States of America. What we now have is an occupying military government where the will of the conqueror governors, governs. As a result, in the ceded or subjugated territories, all laws which forbid treaty violations with foreign nations or which forbid the granting of rank and titles or commercial privileges in conflict with the supreme law of the land are abrogated. The North waged a war of aggression and thus committed a crime against peace. We are and now have been under military occupation since 1863. William Whiting, the Solicitor General under Abraham Lincoln in his book, War Powers Under the Constitution of the United States, states, it has been asserted that the municipal laws of a belligerent territory remain in force propria vigor in all their strength until altered by military orders. But although such laws may have been tacitly adopted or the enforcement thereof may have been permitted, it is not because these laws retained any validity propria vigor. Their only validity was derived from the tacit or express sanction and adoption thereof by the will of the commander in chief of the invading army. That's how we're held. We, the American people, are considered public enemies, belligerents, hostile belligerents, and must obey the Constitution laws or proclamations of the occupying government. We are considered citizens of the government, and a citizen subject is bound to obey the laws laid down by the government. An alien citizen, however, owes no allegiance or obedience to the conquering government and is not bound to obey any laws implemented by it. An alien citizen, a civilian, civilian, not citizen, we are not citizens, being under no obligation of obedience is justified in refusing such obedience. Over an alien civilian, this government can make no constitution, law, or proclamation of obligatory force because the law of the conqueror binds only their own subjects and those laws have no extraterritorial jurisdiction. No laws of the conquering government will be enforced upon the enemy until they have been subjugated. When that event takes place, whether it be the result of battles or of returning sanity of repentant madmen, the Army of the United States will then have actual possession of every portion of the United States and the proclamations issued by the government during the war will be secured to the inhabitants of the country. That's whiting still. The commander in chief has the right during times of war to treat local laws as inoperative or to adopt some and reject others, to permit the holding of courts by local authorities acting under military power of the conqueror or to forbid them and to substitute military courts of his own. Having all the rights of war over the subjugated inhabitants, he has the powers of a government de facto and de jure and can therefore impose upon them, upon them whatever laws or regulations may suit his pleasure in accordance with the laws of war. Congress may modify by legislation the hardship of belligerent rights. Such are the terms and conditions of war and those conditions are carried out by the occupying army. We, the people of the United States of America, are tired of war. We, the people of the United States of America, are weary of the enforced debt which has been our never-ending burden to carry. The men and women and agencies waging war against us in, their own in our own homes, on our own homeland, have eaten out our substance with their use of war powers. We, the people, declare the hostilities to be at an end. We will no longer live in a war zone, and we must and do declare peace. We will no longer allow silent weapons for quiet wars to encroach on our unalienable rights. We, the people, declare peace. We declare Lincoln's General Order 100 and the Reconstruction Acts of 1867 and all succeeding acts of war repealed, nullified, and void. We declare the 1040 bond repayment at an end. 
We declare the war on poverty, the war on drugs, the war on terror, and all the scores of other wars perpetrated on us by the occupation of government to date, repealed by this plebiscite of peace. We are a creator-loving and peaceful people, and we will no longer be subjugated and separated from our rights. The unalienable rights endowed to us by our creator, the rights which have been the bedrock of this nation since the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776. Whenever any form of government becomes disrupt disruptive to the people who instituted that government and gave it just powers to operate, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. We declare the war powers government to be abolished. We need not itemize the long list of usurpations of our unalienable rights. We need only refer to the Declaration of Independence, which enumerated the travesties, which were crushing the people of this nation at that time, to know that we are enduring an even more ominous and oppressive form of tyranny now. This war powers tyranny will not and cannot stand in the face of peace. Therefore, we the people declare an end to the wars which have been imposed upon us. Further, we who are, you don't have to do an affidavit, we who are signatories of this plebiscite claim and declare executed our rights under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We declare poverty, cancer, terror, drugs, and all the other war concepts the victors. We unconditionally surrender but concede no spoils of war to the victors for their surreptitious engagements. We conclude these wars with this plebiscite of the people. We declare an end to any and all emergencies and will not be separated from our rights or our property from this day forward by the implementation of an emergency. We declare the end to tyranny by what has become a democratic government and restore the republic as the rightful form of government. We declare that any man or woman who desires to occupy a governmental office to be bound to the Constitution of the United States of America by taking and publicly filing an Article 6 oath before assuming the duties of that office. We declare any and all debts which have been accumulated in our name to be extinguished. And just as those noble men who came before us rely on the protection of divine providence, and we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honors, the people have spoken, so it shall be. It's a miracle it got up. I now have a website that you can go. And when I, ha when I am really lousy at social media, I am really lousy at marketing. It is our job, these people in this room and anybody that sees it, it is our job to get it before the public. It is our job to push this plebiscite. There's a, on, on the website, it, it gives the, a place to sign the, the plebiscite and a place to donate. I mean, if anybody, I, I don't care if it's a dollar, five dollars, the donations will be greatly welcomed and this has to be presented, this plebiscite, when it is done, has to be presented to the Congress as the vote of the people. Someone has to do that. If not me, somebody else. It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be long, it's gonna be, it, it, it's gonna be difficult. I don't think it will be difficult to get so many signatures. To get them to pay attention will be a little bit more difficult. I think we have a president in place that will welcome the plebiscite. I could be wrong, but I don't think he likes war any more than the rest of us or what's happened. He was too long a businessman to know, to appreciate what's going on now. But again, the fact that we continue to do this, we continue to, to put forth candidates, pay them money, and live through their excruciating campaigns, go to the polls, listen to all the crap about them on the, on the television set, all the pundit shows, all the stuff that is centered around the restriction of our rights. That's their only job, to go make another law. Code, rule, ordin ordinance, regulation. Every one of those restricts the rights we all already have, and we, I think I've shown you that the supreme law of the land will suffice for anything we have, will it not? Mm -hmm. This has to be done. I would like 40 million. I would, I'd be happy with 2 million. I would like 40 million at least. Yes, ma'am. I want 40 million. I'll settle for 20. I'd take two. I want reaction from the people. I want the people to know the truth. The truth is in the plebiscite. 
People don't know that. They can just read the, the, the thing that leads up to the plebiscite and the plebiscite itself to know the truth and set themselves free. We only need to vote one time and it's settled. We don't need all these elections. We don't need all these governments. I think that we can do get together and hire a trash hauler. What do you think? Or if we need a street paved, we can get among the people and take up a donation, right? We don't need all of these rules and restrictions that we allow. And every one of those jobs comes with a salary. Every one of those jobs comes with a retirement. These people have, you can see by Cornyn and Perry, how many jobs can they hold in the government to get retirement from? There's no restriction on that. They take from us. They have eaten out our substance. Yes, Tom. And that goes to the local, the county, uh, yeah, Mary. That goes to the local uh, commissioner, uh, judge, uh, who wants to share. No, it goes community. to the Congress. Yeah, but this, I mean, this whole game where they. Oh, oh, you mean who does it apply to? Yeah. Anybody who thinks, as I said in the beginning, if they claim to be a governmental official and they're approaching you with anything but protection for you and your property, we don't need them. We don't want them. They should get out of our face. The only reason we instituted governments among men was to protect our rights and property. And my next uh, the question I'm really going to ask is, isn't this essentially what Brexit was? They, they had... I don't know if you call it a plebiscite. And yet, when the, the excitement all fades away, the worms come in and take it away. I, I can't, what I can't. What can we do to avoid that? Well, I'll just have to tell you, like Benjamin Franklin said, we've given you a republic, now it's your job to keep it. I think we've lived through enough of this abuse to know what we should have. I think we're all decent people at heart. I think most people in this country are decent. We can't take from one and give to another. We can't do it. We can't have all these people on welfare. When I lived in Austria, I would see people outside the road picking up trash and whatnot. And so I asked, do you have welfare in Austria? They said, well, we have a means to help people that need it. But we try not to demean them and we try to, to, to satisfy them, give, give them sustenance, but satisfy them as well. If they get welfare in this country, they work 40 hours at any job they can do. If they were a mother in a home and needed help, she took care of other mother's children. If, if they were a war veteran with something shot off, then maybe they could type in an office, but they put in 40 hours a week, so they were never on welfare. They were made to feel like they worked and contributed for their money. We cannot continue to have a welfare nation because when we have a welfare nation, we have a war nation. And we, uh, the, the bankers have us exactly where they want us. I read a thing on, <clears throat> nobody understands what happened in the, in, to the money. I mean, so FDR comes out and gives a speech and says you don't have property anymore, it all belongs to the United States and you don't have any money anymore, by the way. And it happened to be 1933, he said that. It happened to be the year that in April they passed the, the, the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act, the, the Federal Reserve Act died on, on December 23rd, 1933. And the Glass-Steagall Act was already in place and the Glass-Steagall Act gave all the profits from the, from the money, from whatever they set up, the Federal Reserve Act, to the Federal Reserve. Where before, it went to the treasurer of the United States to buy gold to, to, to stabilize the dollar. They gave it to the Federal Reserve on that day. You can't call it anything but a giveaway. And then it, it recycles. At what point did the, government, did the Federal Reserve own all the money, or what used to be money, of the United States? About, what, 18, 1967? They own it all. We operate on somebody else's script. That script is payable to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve are the international bankers. We have to stop. We have to vote once for us, not a vote for Beto, not a vote for anybody else, a vote for me, a vote for you. 
And that's what that plebiscite does. Then we're a country without a government. Then we'll have to figure it out. I think we can probably go through the rubble and make it work. What do you think? Get nowhere without trying. Exactly. Get nowhere without trying. Yeah, you're exactly right. Here's a little tidbit about property tax suits. Everybody has to pay their property taxes or the county will take it away, correct? Well, it finally, I finally figured the whole thing out. They sue an in-rem suit. An in-rem suit is against property. And that's, they very clearly, when they sue for property tax, it says it's an in-rem suit. So they're, they're, this, the debt is against the property and they notice the person that owns the property that there's going to be a hearing in court in case they wanted to make a claim for the property. They, they say that they're foreclosing on a lien. Before they can do an interim suit, the rules are the property has to be seized. Physically seized. Before the county can go to court. That's the little flaw, the fly in their ointment. The, the, uh, let's say that the IRS says you owe money, and they go through that process they go through, and they, then they put a notice of federal tax lien in public record, like I showed you. That's a seizure of your property. You, do you realize that? No. Do you know that? How? Happened to me. Well, then, no, they have the right to come and take your property once it's under their control. A seizure is the control of the person that's going to take it. They don't physically seize it until after that seizure is put in. That is actually a seizure. I didn't know that. When they put that notice of tax lien in, in public record, that is a constructive seizure because you can't do anything with your property with that thing on there and they have seized it. Whether they take it or not is another thing. But they have the right to come and take it administratively because of that seizure. Unlawful seizure, granted, but still, that's what it is. And when they do an HOA, the, the, the homeowner contracted with the HOA to pay homeowner's dues. Like it or not, they contracted. So they have a contract. They don't pay their dues. Can the, can the homeowner's association go out and, and seize the property? No, no, they have to sue for the debt. So they sue for $3,000 in taxes. Then they get a judgment. Now they put that judgment as an abstract of judgment in property in the public. That is the lien. That is the seizure. That's when they seize your property because you can't do anything about it until they pay, until you get a release of lien. Where is the lien from the county on property tax? No, it is not. It's in statutes, it says, a lien automatically arises against the property on January 1st of every year by operation of law. That's what it says. That is not a seizure, sir. That's a statutory declaration. Where is the seizure of the property in a county foreclosure sale on property tax? There isn't one. They have no enforcement ability unless they, they run that past you and you're not smart enough to get out of it. And I just barely saw it two weeks ago. So, and I've been at this a long time. But I read so many in REM cases, and every single one of them says the seized property shall. All of these, all of these seizures that they're doing to American people at the side of the road, they're taking their money, their asset forfeiture stuff, they can seize the property, but then they have to hold a civil hearing to see if anybody else has a claim on it. And then they have to prove that they have a right to that seized property, that the person owed a debt or committed a crime. Now, Ruth Gator Ginsburg just gave a second. We have, we have uh, Austin v. somebody or other. The first case I found on an, on a, an Eighth Amendment violation, the Ginsburg court just gave an, us another one to, to uh, pile onto that about asset forfeiture seizure. 
And you can't do it. You can't seize anything unless you have a contract and you didn't pay and there's a, there's a lien in public record or you committed a crime, you've been found guilty of the crime and they take the property as part of the seizure because it was involved in the crime. So all of these asset forfeiture seizures are, are illegal as can be, but so is the seizure of a property under a property tax suit because they never seized the property. Very first criteria for an interim suit. Isn't that a kicker? Questions?